Thank you very much, and thank you to the Hans Buckler Foundation for inviting me to be with you today. Um, I hope I will reassure you saying that this is not a lecture, <laughs> uh, at least not in the academic sense. Um, I do have here a kind of very particular position. Um, quite recently, I've been lucky enough to join uh, Industrial Europe, which is the European Trade Union Federation for uh, Manufacturing Sectors, as policy advisor. Uh, that was recent because previously I used to be a researcher uh, and I spent actually a decade of researching workers' voice in corporate governance. Uh, and what I would like to do uh, this afternoon during the 20 minute slot I got is not an academic lecture, uh, but it is just sharing with you what are the uh, main things. That's extremely disturbing. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. See you. No, 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 yeah, yeah. No, I'll try to be natural. Um, <laughs> not easy. Um, no, so yeah, what I'd like to share is, is not like an academic lecture, but m really mainly the most striking things which I discovered or learned during those, uh, well, almost a decade actually, uh, of work on the topic. One first message actually, and, and I'm afraid that to, to a certain extent, sorry, uh, I might repeat or stress what has been already said. Uh, I might actually also challenge uh, and disagree with some point which were made. Uh, but the first message uh, is that in Europe, workers are granted a voice in corporate governance in many different ways. Um, well, first, you have to uh, consider that uh, corporate governance, we are here talking about corporate governance bodies, and at the top tier uh, of company, you would have three main bodies. The first one is the top management team. And here, although it has been mentioned already, it is uh, worth uh, just saying that in Europe, you would have two main corporate governance uh, structure. The first one, which is very well known in Germany, is called the two-tier structure because you would have two boards. You would have a supervisory board, and excuse my German, Aufsichtsrat. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that do supervise the work of the management board, the, Vorstand as well. Uh, and then the Vorstand would be the top management team. And that's a two-tier system. And then in other countries, and in some countries you would have the two system actually, you have one tier with one single board, which is the board of directors. But that doesn't mean that you don't have the top management team. Uh, it does exist, the CEO and the senior level manager, but simply in this system, they are not part of a legally recognized body. They are just a team. And then you would have this either management board or top management team as a first uh, corporate governance body. The second one will be the uh, annual meeting of shareholders because shareholders too uh, take strategic uh, decisions which are important for the future of the company. And then you would have the board itself. So in the one tier system, the board of directors and in the two tier system, the supervisory board. And I think that the first, uh, uh, Striking uh, things that I learned is that in Europe, if you look at the existing national law, you would see that workers can have the, a voice in each of these three bodies. Then the spread and the breadth of it uh, is quite uh, uh, varied because, for instance, in the top management team, workers could be involved in the composition. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, that is the case in Slovenia, in Germany, and in Poland. So to give you an example, in Slovenia, the, uh, in company with more than 500 employees, the Works Council is entitled to nominate one member of the management board. Uh, that is a kind of equivalent of the Arbeitsdirektor that you have in the uh, mountain industry uh, in Germany. Um, but then that concerns only three countries, really. In the meeting of shareholders, uh, workers could also be granted a consultative voice. That is the case in Bulgaria, in Hungary, and in the Netherlands. Um, in Bulgaria, Ekaterina would maybe know it more than me, uh, in firms which have more than 50 employees, workers are represented. They could, uh, they could attend the general meeting. They could express their opinion. Actually, they could not vote, but at least they are there and can take part in the meeting. You might have some situation very rare or where workers have more extended rights. That is the case in France. Uh, because in France, the Works Council actually could submit uh, a resolution that then will be discussed and votes by the shareholders. 
And then uh, the uh, last form, really, of workers' voice is when workers are represented on the board. So either, again, with a consultative voice, that is the case in France, in Romania, in Sweden, and in Norway, in the sense that, um, for instance, in Romania, the CEO can invite the trade unions uh, to discuss uh, some issues which are more labor-related issues, but there will only be a discussion. So then the opinion could be expressed, but there is no obligation to take it into account. And then you have another, and that is the last situation, where the opinion would be taken into account, because then workers on the board would have the same rights and the same duty as all the board members, including the right to vote. And this is a situation that you would find in, uh, find in no less than 19 European countries. Uh, so what you can see already from this table is that if you take all the different rights together, it's no less than 21st country, and that's 20 member states out of the 28, plus Norway, I will come back to that in a minute, that do grant workers a voice in corporate governance. And that leads me to my uh, second message, uh, which is that those arrangements uh, for workers' voice in corporate governance, and especially representation on corporate boards, as we saw that this is the main one spread one, is actually so widespread in Europe that it is deemed uh, a distincting feature of the European social model, uh, quite often underlined by some uh, American researcher who researched industrial democracy in Europe. This is really something which is quite typical of our social model, if one exists. And going back to the discussion you had in the workshop, uh, well, we all know, and it is quite well known, the German system of uh, Unternehmensmitbestimmung. Yeah, I'm doing great, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so that, yes, in Germany, you have this right for board level employee representation, but it is not just a German idiosyncrasy or of fantasy. Uh, this is a right you would find out in uh, not least the neighboring country. Uh, as Wolfgang Greif, some neighboring countries get influenced by the German system. So you would find board level employee representation rights sorry, also in Austria, as been mentioned, in Slovakia, in Hungary, in Slovenia, in Croatia, but also in the Netherlands, in France, in Luxembourg, and not to forget the Nordic country, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. And in all these group of countries, um, the laws state the obligation for companies, both from the public sector and the private sector, to have worker representative on their board. For the last group of countries that is composed of Poland, Czech Republic, Greece, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland, that has been mentioned by our first speaker, reporter of the first working group. You do also have some rights for board level employee representation, but they are limited to state-owned companies and so only to the uh, public sectors. Uh, and if you only already consider this first difference uh, in terms of colors and also what has been reported from the working group, then you could have an idea of what would be my third message. Uh, which is that if you only look from a legal perspective, so there we are only talking about the rights, you would see that uh, employee representation at board level is diverse, as the national rights vary markedly. Um, that's some flavor we have from the discussion, the report from Caspar or from Wolfgang, for instance, on this matter. Um, the national rights, they do differ with regard to several variables. The first one is the scope, uh, that is a characteristic of the companies that will be obliged uh, or under request to open the board to work a rep. Uh, as mentioned, in some cases, uh, it's both private sector and public sector companies. In some other countries, only state-owned companies will be covered. The legal statute does make some difference. You could have a feeling that, like in Germany, it's both public, uh, private limited company and public limited company that are covered. Uh, in some system, that is the case in Luxembourg, for instance, or in Slovakia, it's only public limited company uh, that are covered by the legal obligation. The size, which is one of the key points of difference. Uh, 
There are some laws that say that the size does not matter in a way. Uh, that is the case for the Austrian public limited company, no matter how many employees they have, as long as they do have a works council, actually. Uh, but they would have to have a, a worker representative on their board. Most commonly, there is a minimum threshold in terms of workforce, uh, starting from low thresholds. Uh, the lowest one is in Sweden. So in Sweden, as soon as a company has 25 employees, so that's a very minimalistic approach to it, um, the lowest threshold ever, then you, you would have this uh, case of Denmark with a threshold of 35 employees. So we are in this group and that's one of the distincting features of the Nordic countries and law. Um, but those small companies already would be governed by the law that say you could have workers on your board. And this, there are then the opposite situation with very high thresholds. Uh, and uh, then the obligation will only apply to large, to very large company. Uh, and such is the case in Luxembourg uh, and in France. Uh, the private companies in France would be obliged to have board level employee reps uh, as soon as they have 1,000 employees. So you go from 25 to up to 1,000 employees. Uh, then the national rights, uh, they also differ with regard to the characteristic of the board. I didn't mention the difference between the two systems. Uh, one other element is that is um, uh, related to the duty of the board. Uh, we have a specific case in Hungary, for instance, where the board is only there to issue non-binding recommendation to the management. So then it is kind of a weak board, really. And then you could it is difficult to compare with a situation, which is the most common one, uh, where management, uh, the board approval will be required for management to implement the strategic decision. One key point also of difference is the composition when it comes to worker participation. There, you also go from a situation where the law will state an obligation for having only one worker rep on the board. Uh, that is the case uh, in Croatia, that is also the case in the private companies in France. And that goes up to the German situation that you would find in the large German companies with more than 2,000 employees. This situation where half of the supervisory board is composed of worker reps. But these are kind of the two extreme really, because if you look at the national law, you would see that on average, uh, it is a proportion of one third of the board, as mentioned in the case of Denmark, that will have to be uh, a composed of worker rep. Another point of difference is uh, the selection mechanisms, how those worker reps uh, are appointed to the board. There are also many different ways to do so. Election by the employees, appointment by the trade unions, appointment by the works council. Um, since, uh, since a very new uh, law in France, uh, you could have appointment by the European Works Council as well, that give a European flavor, European mandate, uh, yeah, European dimension to the mandate. The profile of employee representative also is not all of the same. Most often, employees of the company only are entitled to sit on the board. Uh, and then the question that was mentioned, I suppose, I think by Caspar is, when you are a group level, you would also include all the employees from your company in your country, but do you also include the employee from the foreign subsidiary? Would they be also entitled to sit on the board or would they be also entitled to vote, for instance, in the case of election? Uh, in Germany, you will have the situation of some reserved seats, uh, not just in Germany, by the way, um, seats which would be reserved for external trade union officer, for instance, or for a certain category of staff, like professional and managerial staff, uh, like in France. And then the very specific Dutch situation, which is that we talk about employee representation, but the representative on the board cannot be neither an employee of the company nor a trade unionist, nor a member of the uh, trade union, uh, which is in collective bargaining arrangement with the company. And in this situation, quite often, Jan, you would tell me, but then uh, the employee representative is someone from the outside, a trade union friendly politicians or academics sitting on the board then on the behalf of the workforce. Final point of difference uh, is how the um, uh, mechanism is triggered. Well, 
That would be automatic in many cases. As soon as a company falls into the scope of the legal obligation, it will have to op open the board to worker reps. In the Northern country, this is a right that exists, but it requires an initiative from either the workers or the trade unions to get enforced. So this is a right which is at the disposal of workers or trade unions, but they have to demand it. That would be one of the explanation of the relatively low coverage rate uh, that Kaspar mentioned, because in Denmark, if the workers do not take the initiative to ask for the rights to be represented on the board, they will not. Looking at this long list, you may have the feeling, and if you only look at this table, you may say, okay, that is, we are just taking, talking about something which is so diverse. There is one heading, we are talking about board level employee representation, but it is so diverse, there is nothing in common. Um, uh, and actually, you would be right because this legal diversity is reflected in practice, uh, simply because we are talking about law in the sense that if your law said that your worker reps will have to be elected by the workforce, we know that in practice, it will be elected by the workforce. So diversity is kind of uh, reflected uh, in practice. But one of the, uh, and that would be my last message, uh, lesson that I learned from, from doing research is that the variation in the law actually does not prevent shared practices so that commonalities exist on how employee representatives operate at board level. How do we know that? Uh, we know that because there were quite few uh, empirical research uh, which were conducted at national level. You have some of the authors, Kaspar being one from Denmark, for instance. I worked a bit on the French case as well. Um, but in addition, I've been lucky enough to uh, work with uh, Jeremy Waddington uh, on the first ever survey uh, that we did by questionnaire, by sending questionnaires uh, to all board level employee representatives in 16 uh, European countries. Uh, that was a study we did at the European Trade Union Institute. Uh, we received financial support from the Hans Buckler Foundation. And thanks to this, we managed to have a view on how it works in practice, really. And we found out that, yes, there are differences, but there are also practices that are just similar across borders. And what is interesting is that when you look at those practices, which are quite similar on average, or for, on the majority of cases, they also uh, help to answer some prejudices that are quite still ongoing about board level employee representation. Uh, the first one uh, is, are board level employee representatives silent and passive at board meeting, uh, as was mentioned? Um, yes, you would have the cases, but what we know from practice is that these are exceptions, because in real, the vast majority, irrespective of the country, is so that, no, they are not silent and passive. They are active board members that intervene at board meetings, outside of board meetings, in many ways. One of the most common ways being to uh, request that the board agenda be enlarged, usually to topics which are otherwise overlooked by the boards, uh, like topics related to human resources policies. Our board level employee rep representative representing a particularistic sectional interest. This question that usually comes from the opponent uh, to the system, uh, opponent that claim that you are entitled to be a board member only if you uh, want to defend the interests of the company as a whole. But if you want to defend just one small interest, that of the workers, then you're not entitled. You, want, you, you will be biased in your evaluation. So our board level employee representative, those biased uh, parties on the board, no, they are not. And this is also something which is quite common across the countries. They do defend this overarching interest of the company because they do also have the feeling and conviction that interests of the company, interests of the employees are intertwined. Uh, so they do uh, uh, deem as equally important the economic matters or the financial aspect, the merger and acquisitions, but also, also the social matters. That does not mean that they defend the interests of the shareholders. That was quite clear in our study. They defend the company, they defend the interests of workers, but shareholders, that is not that business indeed. 
but they do care about the overarching interest of the company. Are polyvalent player representatives incorporated with management perspective and isolated from workers and trade unions? That is a kind of fear that we usually uh, uh, hear from the leftist trade union that have been quite something we heard for quite some years in France from the part of the CGT, who feared that, well, if you uh, sit on this table with all those men with their good suits and their cigars, maybe you will lose your rank and file cultures and values. Uh, so are they kind of lost in this uh, managerial world? Uh, no. Uh, and again, I'd like to stress this is the vast majority. That does not prevent that in some cases, I suppose. Some maybe find it very upsetting to, to smoke cigars. Uh, but certainly on average, uh, that is not the case. Uh, and that is not the case because those employer reps, they do have connection with the other institution of labor uh, uh, representation. Maybe not all of them because usually they have closest connection with the institution that nominate them. So if they have been appointed by the trade union, they will have close connection with the trade union, if that's by the Works Council, close connection with the Works Council. And close connection means not only they would report back their activities to the board, but also they will uh, work with this institution as a source of information and influence to uh, build up their uh, decision on the board. Finally, are board level employee representatives an additional channel of workers' involvement? Uh, that's more the opponent of the system from the trade union side who may say, well, why would we care if we have works council and trade unions that have even uh, enough rights? What would be the additional added value? Well, there is an additional added value, and it is related to the quality of information. Uh, Compared to worker representatives in other uh, institutions of labor, uh, that is clear, for instance, in the case of European Works Council, uh, they may be a bit critical as to the quality of information they might receive. Here on the board, given the fact that they do receive the same uh, amount, extent, uh, and quality of information as other board members, they do have better assessments, and then this information shared with the other institution of labor uh, representation build a complete picture of our integrated architecture of workers' involvement. So in brief, in Europe, uh, workers' voice in corporate governance can take place within the different corporate governance bodies. Is so widespread that it is deemed a distinctive feature of the European social model for level employee representation is characterized by a great legally based or legally defined diversity, which however does not prevent commonalities in practice. And based on these commonalities in practice, there is open doors for Europeanized form that goes, uh, that transcend the diversity of law, the Europeanized form of worker voice in corporate governance, which I think is the second part of the workshop. I thank you very much. <laughs>